You are listening to the Grace Covenant Cornelius Podcast. So if you've been following along, yeah, I'm still wondering, like, how do I follow that? So this is the thing that I began to think this morning as we were, uh, as we were approaching. I was having conversations with Pastor Farrell and, um, and, you know, him asking me if I would cover for him this morning and then finding out that other staff members are out and, and then getting here and, and the cancellation of things. And uh, technically, you guys, you guys probably didn't notice this, but technically there were some things in the background uh, that wasn't working properly uh, this morning. I knew we were going to make this announcement about Mike and he was going to be sharing. And so the whole time I kept thinking, man, this... This is just not normal, right? And then I thought, I'm so glad that this is not normal. I'm so glad that that God brings us to times and places, and I think it should be a lot more often than it is, that things are just not normal for us. However, this is the thing that I do know that's normal and even awesome, and that's just Jesus. Gee, I mean, he's the, he's the whole reason we're here this morning, right? So for me, like, everything could fall apart, and then we as children of God could still come into this place, and we could still lift our hands, and we could still lift our voices, and we could still lift the name of Jesus to see God work in a powerful way, right? So maybe we need to have some times where technically things don't happen right, and there's some announcements we may not like. Maybe the lights go out. I don't, I don't know. I was just thankful. This whole morning that just things weren't, I was here during worship practices as things were happening. I was like, man, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that we don't rely on these things to worship you. Right? So let's get into James. I got to get into the message sometime this morning, right? Get into James. And so I just want to let you know this, too, because I, you know, people give me a hard time around here. One, I started to think when when Mike was announcing his resignation, I'm like, I've only been here two years and everybody's quitting. I'm like, Jesus, what's, what's wrong with me? But I did want to set the record straight because Pastor Farrell's always giving me a hard time about coffee. I just want to let you know that on purpose this morning, I had one 10-ounce cup of coffee, and that's it. That's it. So everything else is not coffee, even though I'm still wanting some coffee, but just t- one 10 So we've been in the book of James. In fact, if you didn't know this, on Wednesday nights, we have also been following along in the book of James. We have a group that meets right in Clanton Hall after the dinners, and we've just been going through the book of James. In fact, we've read every verse in that book over the last several Wednesday nights. This is the thing I love about the book of James. He just doesn't pull any punches. James doesn't mix words. He doesn't try to make it sound nice so it's pleasing to us. James just, James just tells us how it is. And we're even going to read some verses this morning where James is really confronting. Listen, this was written to Christians. It was written to us, specifically the, the Christians that James was actually writing this to. However, this is for us. This is a challenge for us as Christ followers as we read these words, words that we will in just a few moments. This is a challenge for us. I think perhaps that as a church family, maybe even after the series is over, we just as individuals, we spend some more time in the book of James. And let it just challenge you. Because I can tell you, uh, not only on Sunday mornings, but as we've been going through it on Wednesday night, every verse that I read is just like, whoa, I need to stop and think about that. For a few more moments. I need to pray about, God, is this something that you're finding in me? And even as I'm reading it, you're confronting that in me. You guys ready to get into it? This is just the start. Here we go. We're going through this series on putting your faith to work, which, by the way, I have to do better with. And I love Jesus with everything that's in me. But I have to be better at putting my faith to work, the things that I know about him and also the things I know about me who is in him. I've got to be better about putting those things to work, and that's what we've been talking about. Living out your faith does not casually happen. It requires confronting points and places of conflict in your life. Don't check out on me just because I talked about conflict. Don't check out. It's good. We're going to see how we can address the conflict and even work through conflict. But it requires confronting points and places of conflict in your life. And James is helping us do that by being so forward in the way that he's communicating with us. 
But first, let's start reading by, uh, Luke 9, 23 to 24. It says this, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Listen, how many of you would raise your hand and say, that doesn't quite make sense. But it's God speaking to us. To say, if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. It's almost like give and you will receive, right? Listen, you cannot pursue God and at the same time choose to go your own way and do your own thing. Following God requires death to yourself, which creates conflict. If you've been with us on Wednesday night, some of this is going to be a repeat for you. But for me, I, I, I picture it much like, you know, the devil, me, my name's David, the devil David on one shoulder and the angel David on the other shoulder. And how there's just conflict all the time as I'm living out this life following Jesus. Because the flesh and, and my spirit is at war constantly. Listen, it requires death to ourself. And when we're dying to ourself, how many of you would admit that that's just not comfortable? In fact, many times it feels like conflict. Yeah, it seems like, looks like, sounds like conflict. So we're going to be going through James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to break it down as we hit the main points of this morning. And I would ask you this, that as we go through this, if you find a verse or a point that is challenging to you. In other words, that conflict begins to rise up, and it may even rise up like this. Well, that's not me. Right? I would especially say, if you think that first, to go ahead and circle that, highlight it, do whatever, star it, whatever you need to do to bring yourself back to these points as you go through the week and the next few months. Let God transform us by his word. So let's talk about the faith that confronts conflict. Here's some challenges that we face. The first one is this. The challenge of wrong motives puts us in conflict with others. Let's just have an altar call. We'll pray and we'll go home. Right? We could stop. We, I could talk the rest of the morning, the rest of the day, in fact, just on this one point. The challenge of wrong motives puts us in conflict with others. We see that in James verses 1 through 3. So what puts us in conflict with others? The word says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your, your desires that battle within you? Your desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So what's, what causes conflict with others? Obviously them. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> you were like, wait, what, what? No, obviously not them. Listen, I have, I've just come to learn that most of the time, 99.999% of the time, if I'm in conflict with somebody, most of the time it's me. It's not them. And, and I can say that with that certainty because most of the time if I'm in conflict, at least my response is not correct. Right? No, the conflict is coming from my own evil desires and my own motives. And I have to allow the Holy Spirit to confront that in my life when it's happening in the moment. Because I want to be transformed. I want to be changed. I want to see people like Jesus sees people. I want to love people like Jesus loves people, even in the midst of conflict. But can we just be real with each other? We typically approach conflict with others with selfish and sometimes even evil motives, right? Because we'll approach conflict, arguments, disagreement with these things in mind. One, my desires. We see that straight from Scripture. How about this? My thoughts. Like I go into a disagreement already with thoughts that I've established within my own mind. How about my, my needs? I, I go into an argument, a conflict, a disagreement with my needs in mind. And we simply have the intent to win and, and not resolve. Listen, I know, I know that for myself. How many of you would also say, uh, let's, just, let's start with this question. How many of you love to argue? Come on, there's more in here. I'm arguing. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's, look, for me, like, I, I, I happen to like to argue and I like to debate. And sometimes I'll call it a debate, but really it's an, it's an argument. But when, when I'm going into those, listen, if, if I'm not careful, I go into a disagreement, a conflict, a point of tension, not with the heart to resolve, but to win. If I'm not careful, like that's, that's, my, that's my flesh. And I have to be aware of that. With, with every disagreement. Look, I've been, uh, I've been married for a long time, and, and we've had some disagreements. But I'm, I'm still allowing God to transform the way that I approach those disagreements and, and, and that conflict. I don't, I don't need to win. It's not about winning. It's, a really, it's really about approaching each conflict with the love of Jesus because most of the time, the conflict has to do with someone else. It has to do with others. Listen, if, if some of you, apparently not many of you, so if, you're, if this isn't you, you can just... When we have this approach of, of winning and not resolving, this is typically how we would approach a conflict. That when I leave the conversation... I want to change your mind. I really have no intent of thinking differently, seeing things differently. I want to change, I want to change your mind. Typically when I uh, approach, if, if, if I'm not careful, when I approach conflict, disagreement, I want to change your actions. Right? Look, come on, you're the reason we're having this conflict. I want, to, I want to change your actions. I want to change your perspective. I want to change your feelings. I want to change your ideologies. Come on now. We've seen that across our country and even inside the church this past year. When we approach conflict with this type of motive and James is calling it out of us. Like, listen, that's coming from your own fleshly desires and, and evil motives. And listen, I want the Holy Spirit to confront that within me. Not just not just as I'm preparing for a message, but ongoing. I just want the Holy Spirit that each time this rises up within me, I want him. I want the Holy Spirit to confront it in me. Listen, our motive is, is no longer unity unless that unity comes by assimilation. Some of you would understand that word assimilation because that's, the, that's, what, that's what happens when I'm trying to change the way that you think. When I'm trying to change the way that you feel and the way that you see things. And listen, our our motive, and James is challenging this within us. Listen, this was happening in the church there that James is confronting. He says it, man. They were fighting. I mean, he even uses words like war and kill, and it must have been serious. They were having some serious disagreements, and James is confronting this. Listen, we've got to approach conflict with others from the motive of love. I, I just, I love them. And if I don't, let the Holy Spirit transform that. Let the Holy Spirit change that within you before you even approach a conversation. Listen, the problem isn't the belief and sometimes strong belief you have. It's how you treat others who don't think or believe the same. And James is confronting that within us. I mean, let's just confess right now as Christ followers, we've treated those who don't think and believe the same with, with contempt. I've been thinking a lot about that word. I read a book a book. Uh, a few years ago that dealt with this word contempt, and this word contempt means that I no longer value you. And I, I would say that, in the, especially in this last year, and it's crept its way into the church, that we've been, being, uh, we, we've been approaching conflict, and from that conflict we're developing contempt for each other instead of love. And let's, let's ask God this morning to change that within us. So that first is the challenge of wrong motives puts us in conflict with others. Look at James 4, verses 4 through 5. I love how he starts this one out. Makes me feel all fuzzy inside. You adulterous people. (laughs) Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? In other words, if you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God? Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? James starts that passage or that section with you adulterous people. The second point is this, the challenge of spiritual adultery puts us in conflict with our affections. The challenge of spiritual adultery puts us in conflict with our affections. 
I love that the James doesn't candy coat words here when he uses you adulterous, you adulterous people. And so I, I, I think we Christians are, are far, too, far too good about justifying things within our own lives. Having really good reasons why I might feel a certain way or think a certain way. But as we, as we live a life that we're experiencing that over and over, I mean, James is challenging us this morning. Where, where are your affections? Listen, we cannot divide our affections between God and the world. James is being really clear with that. One of the ways I know this happens even in the church and, is that the church just looks a whole lot like the world now. And when, and when I say the church, I don't mean this building I don't mean our gatherings. I mean us. I mean me. We just look a whole lot like the world now. And what I see in Scripture is that our lives should be so different, it would resemble the contrast between light and darkness. And so I asked that of us this morning, is that our lives? Are we living out a life that is that strong of a contrast? That we are light in a very dark world. Because I would say for, e for even myself, like the things that would resemble darkness, I need to allow God to transform and change that. I need to allow God to change the way that I think, change the way that I process, change the way that I act. Because I don't want to look like the world, I want to look like Jesus. And we as a church, we look, we look far too much like the world. And listen, it's not about avoiding the bad things. It's not that at all. It's about living the way that Jesus lived, doing the things that Jesus did. If, if I focus on that, like everything that's not of him just begins to diminish in my life. But the reason that we don't live this way is because our affections, our affections are divided. If you look back to James 1.8, he tells us when our Lord loyalty is divided between God and the world, we're unstable. Listen to this, in everything, in everything that we do. When our affections are divided, our loyalty is divided between God and the world, the things that are of him and the things that aren't of him. When we're living that type of life, and it says I'm unstable, not just in a few things, not just in my relationship with him, not just in my relationship with my wife, but the Bible's telling me I'm unstable in everything that I do. And I think that God, in, th in these moments, even this morning, as, as strange as things might have happened over the course of the last uh, several minutes, that God is wanting to transform our affections this morning. He, he's wanting to change that within us. That I no longer show affections for the things that aren't of him. That the only thing that I have affections for is Jesus. Jesus. So that as my flesh begins to rise up, I'm confronted with that contrast. I want my affections to be for Jesus. I'm going to sit at the, uh, I'm gonna sit the keyboard for just a few moments. And I, I want us to just worship with just a few words. Because I want, I want God to give us some time. Could we just close our eyes? What I've been asking the Holy Spirit to do in leading up the moments leading up to the service this morning really focus a lot around this point of God reshaping our affections, changing our affections, changing our focus, our perspective. And I can tell you for me what, what it comes down to is I have to say these words a lot more often because it convinces my flesh to follow suit. I mean, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And when my spirit begins to convince my flesh of that, then my actions change. Love you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. We love you, God. Jesus, we love you. You are worthy, Lord. 
you just begin to sing that? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you, we love you, Lord, and only you. We love you, Lord. We love you, God. Listen, there doesn't need to be words on the screen. Could you just begin to sing that? And if you're bold enough, just to begin to sing it out loud. We love you, Lord. We love you, God. We love you, Lord. We love you, God. Oh, Jesus, change our hearts. Change our hearts to love you more. So change our hearts, oh God. So we look to you. Transform us. Change us. Holy Spirit, right now in these moments, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just begin to confront us with affections that are outside of you, affections for other things, affections for other people that are greater than our affections for you, oh God. And Jesus, I pray that there's those in the room this morning that just begin to fall deeply and madly in love with you, Jesus. Love you, Lord. There is none like you. There is none like you, Lord Jesus. We lay our lives down, we lay our thoughts down at your feet, oh God. For you alone, you alone, you alone are worthy of my affections and love. You alone are worthy of my worship, oh God. Just begin to say this, there's none like you, Jesus. There's none like you, Jesus. Listen, I, I believe that even as you're saying that, and even if you feel bold enough to whisper it or say it audibly, listen, I begin to, I believe that things begin to break in our lives, chains, bondage, that our focus comes to him or back to him. And nothing else around us would distract us from our love of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We worship you and you alone, for you alone, you alone are worthy of our worship and praise. Lord, as these moments close, I just pray, Lord, that you help us to, even now where we're at, just confess a few things, a few things that have distracted us, that have drawn our affections from you, O oh God. Lord James is bringing it out. He's saying that one of the challenges that we would face, even as Christ's followers, is that our affections would be for other things and other people and, and a lot of times for ourselves. Change that in us, O oh God. Change that within us, O oh God. Praise you, Lord. Listen, we might come back to that if I have time. At the, I don't have time at the end. I, I want us to just... I want us to man, just rest in that. Let's just keep our eyes closed. I'm, I'm going to cut our notes, Lori, so. The, the last point is this, and, and as we were worshiping through even with that, I think it solves this. But the last challenge that we see in the book here is, in the book of James here is, is this challenge that, of pride and that puts us in conflict with God. So I don't have to go through what pride is and what pride looks like in your life. I think we know. I think we know. 
But I want the Holy Spirit as we leave this place this morning to really challenge us of where we're placing, where we're placing our affections. I can tell you for me that, man, that's changed everything in my life. That's changed everything. When I, as a, as a dude, can just say, man, I am falling crazy and madly in love with Jesus. For me, that changes everything. Changes everything. So, with our eyes closed, is, is that something that you could say this morning? Could you say that you're falling madly in love with Jesus? Because I equate it to much like when, when I first began to have feelings of love for my wife, Brandy. And I remember those times, and in fact, I still have them. And I love seeing her. I love spending time with her. For me, if I'm just sitting close, like everything is just great. And the thing that I've been working on really for years and it's still, it's still happening in, in my life is I want those affections for Jesus. I want those affections for Jesus. God, I pray right now in these final moments, Lord, that that would change within all of us, even in myself, Lord. I know that there's, there's still room to love you more. There's still room to worship you more. There's still need for transformation in my heart and life. Lord, as I fall madly and, and deeply in love with you, that changes everything. But I think that's what the world is just, they're dying literally to see. is a church that is madly in love with you, Jesus that's madly in love with you, that we can't help but to talk about you. We can't help but to worship you. We can't help but to play songs in the background that are mentioning your name. We can't help but to draw close. We can't help but to draw others close, to invite people in. Because we love you that much, oh God. We love you that much, Jesus. But I pray that this week, Something changes, radically changes in our lives. So we, be, we begin, or maybe there's something that happens that's a, that's a catalyst. Maybe these moments are it that man, we are just falling in love with you, Jesus. Change us. Change us, oh God. We praise you. We praise you for everything that you are. Not for everything that you do. You are an awesome, good God. And we praise you just for being God. We worship you because you're God. Help us to love you more, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. amen. Listen, I, I, I really wish we could spend another 30 minutes. But this is the thing that I do know is you have some time this week for, for God to continue to, to work in your life. Listen, listen, guys, I really want to challenge you. I really want to challenge you. Women probably don't have as much difficulty with this. But guys, I really want to challenge you to begin to fall madly and deeply in love with Jesus and to begin to use those words. Man, I'm just, I'm in love with Jesus. I'm in love with who he is. I'm in love with his presence. I'm in love with his voice. I'm, I'm just in love with Jesus. I really challenge you with that. Let God continue to work in your hearts and, and lives this morning. Just as a reminder, uh, the Wednesday night family dinner uh, is canceled, um, but the other program that's happening on Wednesday night is the same. Uh, prayer team, if you would, come on forward. If you need some uh, prayer and you just need to, to have someone pray with you, our prayer team is going to be up front to do that as you leave. Uh, love you guys. Have a great week. I wish we could spend another few hours together. I guess you could come back for the second service too. But <laughs> I know I'm hungry. See you guys. For more information on Grace Covenant Church, our service times, ministry opportunities, directions, and more, visit us at gracecovenant.org.